a lot of the uh, lecture materials are actually coming out of this book. So, so in the ASC, uh, we have two, uh, you can call it the uh, cornerstone, the keystone documents. One is this guidelines for field investigation, and the other one is guideline for forensic practices. Okay, so one discuss about how you should behave as a forensic expert. The other one is how do you do your job as an investigator. Okay, so this is a very uh, important. And uh, so now we, we have spent a whole week talking about the techniques, talking about what forensic engineers do and the, you know, the process and everything. So now we are going into investigation, okay? And how do you um, set up a, a, a study? Uh, as I mentioned, that you need to be able to define the modes of failure, okay? And people are trying very hard to, because all of us have only limited experience, okay? We, we don't do all the cases, you know? So it, it kind of makes this list difficult, unless we have all the uh, structural engineers tell us, oh, this is what I do, this is what I do, then you'll be able to create a strong profile. And depend on the environment that is, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of environment, the, the, the lawsuit can vary, okay? So, for example, many of the structural engineers in, uh, in my group actually are not doing so much structural because in the U.S., Unless something extremely critical happened, you don't get a lot of structural failures. Okay, so most of the time they actually are doing facade, building envelope failures. You know, so that is right now one of the most critical elements because one, with climate change, we have more wind, strong winds and strong rains and flood. So the the building envelope actually has more failures. Okay, and that is why. Um, we are interested in what happened in India because you have more structural system failures, okay? And unless you have failures, you cannot learn from failure, okay? So these are some of the common uh, modes of system failures. Of course, bridge, dam, tunnels, multi-story buildings, single-story buildings, uh, industrial buildings, storage tanks, chimneys, guided to uh, towers, masonry structures, okay? so and. Uh, and then the, the list goes on, uh, arced frames, okay, rigid frames, truss suspension structures, suspension roof systems, long span structural system, continuous framework, flat slabs, uh, multi-story rigid frames, uh, thin shells or walls, and uh, membranes and cantilever structures, okay? So you could quickly realize that when we talk about the profile of a system failure, we're looking at going back to the basic of structure analysis and then defining, you know, the different failure modes, okay? And so when you, when you start to, to being able to profile the problem, then from what you've learned, you recognize that uh, there is possibility of you apply different techniques to solve those problems, okay? So, for example, you may not have learned how to design a thin shell or a membrane type of structure, which is very unique, okay? But there are certain architectural firms that specialize in this kind of analysis. So their engineers will be able to do such investigation, okay? And then uh, material types, okay? So. As structural engineers, we also know that uh, we can distinguish uh, whether it's steel, timber, concrete. The different manufactured uh, materials can also have their own unique failure modes, okay? And uh, in fact, this is one area that probably would, would make it even more specialized, okay? Because, for example, for facade failures, we actually have people who study just the, uh, the change in the material properties of plastic, okay? Because we use plastic for window frames, okay? So if you have an insulation failure, that means the plastic fail, okay? Then you have actually people who are experts in those kind of area, okay? So you quickly realize that 
when we uh, when when the court defines who is an expert, the definition can vary based on how much work you have done in a certain area. Okay, but again, the argument is: Hey, even if I have never done a single window frame design, when somebody bring a case of a window frame failures, can I? do the same kind of scientific investigation to ensure the quality of that failure. You, I mean, ensure the quality of your investigation can actually find the problem. Okay, so, so this is really, really the, 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 the most critical component a, a, in qualifying an expert, okay. And uh, so you no, notice that, you know, from material, Failures. This is, again is looking at the structural system. Okay, this has uh, very limited considerations as far as, as as far as the functional component of the uh, system. Okay, so lateral support again. That's a structural analysis, right? Le leg of lateral support of columns, welding failures, crippling or buckling. All these are different failure modes, right? Had very little to do with serviceability failures, okay? Lack of consideration of stability of the system, consider torsional effects, high tensile stress, and so forth, okay? Uh, high carbon contents, corrosions, weldings, repeated cycle testing, presence of notches or flaws, rapid loading, okay? So all this is uh, uh, for related to the forcing of a system, okay? Uh, we have not looked at some unique components such as fire field system, okay? So fire field uh, steel is a very unique area, okay? And, and so when you have, are investigating one of those cases, you need to talk to somebody who is a fire science expert, okay? And so um, those, those are important things to, to realize, okay? And then uh, for concrete, Free stall cycles, you know, in the northern part, especially when you have free stall issues, shrinkage, okay, chemical attack, strength degradations, okay, so those, and this does not distinguish between high performance concrete, normal concrete, or, you know, some very unique concrete such as the auto conclaved AAC concrete, you know, auto conclaved concrete are used a lot in Europe, okay? And so, in America, we don't use that much of AAC concrete, but uh, autoconclave concrete are very porous, okay? So, they have low strength, so you can imagine how they are applied and how they fail, okay? But uh, again, uh, the, the, an, an expert, especially in concrete, you need to not only know how to do the structure analysis, you also need to know the qualification of the material. In other words, you need to know the manufacturing. So any subcontractors who has a problem, you need to go back and look at all their cylinder tests, you know, for different batches of concrete. And sometimes you can find really good information about why the material fell, okay? Uh, masonry structures, terracottas, so Again, the mix of different kind of uh, uh, materials become, you know, only looking at this, suddenly I realized uh, I have done some building envelope failures in America, but I didn't prepare the material. So uh, in America, we are, uh, we don't use, you know, other than wood, we don't use for residential structures any kind of concrete or related. So for wood structures, you actually become very important to protect the wood, okay, from water, especially water. And so that, that exterior structure is extremely important, okay. And most of the time it's related to paint, what kind of paint material you use, or terracotta material, you know, especially is, if it's a Spanish style home, okay. And uh, so once you, and, and stucco, Stucco, we also use stuccos for exteriors, okay? So sometimes when, when paint or those materials fail, water will intrude, okay, during rainy seasons. And so we do a lot of inspections for that kind of failures because, you know, once, once water gets in, 
then the people will ask very, very critical questions. When did this happen? Because when the water intrudes, you don't see it with your eyes, you know, until the problem becomes really, really bad, okay? So whether the, the water intrusion was due to a particular storm, or it happened even before the storm comes, is sometimes that we have to go in and make an engineering judgment. Okay, so with that note, okay, what kind of information do you think you need to collect in order to to do that kind of analysis? I'm putting everybody on the spot. Any ideas? If you are the investigator and somebody tell you, my wood house has water damage because of the big rain last week, okay, how do you prove that is the case? Uh, yeah, definitely. But you almost guarantee know that the material will be wet. Okay. So one of which is very important, especially for very short-term damage, mold. Mold is not a problem that happens overnight. You know, it takes long time. The if you don't fix your water damage problems, mold will become a big problem. But that happens several months. Okay. And of course, it is related to you know how much moisture in the air. But uh, if you see mold in a, in a house, you pretty much know that that house has this water damage for at least a month, maybe two, maybe three. Okay, so somebody claimed that the water damage was because of a storm last week. Mm -mm. You have the water damage problem even before that. Okay, and so this kind of, uh, you know, direct intuition will tell you many, many things. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so this, is, this is the kind of investigations you have to do, okay? And then the other problem is, where is the mold? Where is the water damage? Is it in the basement? Is it on the roof? Okay, the basement and the roof sometimes can tell you different information as well. On the roof, you, you know that it had nothing to do with flood, okay? In the basement, if this area floods a lot, even if a very small rain, you, you still have mold problem okay so those are 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 just you know just have to learn through experience and th and that is why uh forensic engineering is an area that's very very flexible you know you you get all kinds of information and uh, that is why it's very important as a very young profession we still need to go you know and 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 publish a lot of work so that we can get the experience out to many, many engineers. Okay. Mo 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 is um is the 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 things that grow in your wood on the wood when it's moist. Yeah the the, the, the organism that grows. It will be like a rot uh, rot rotten, rotten, yeah. Like the blue like stuff that grows. It's not a fungus. I think it's more like a, huh? fluorescence. Like a fluorescence. Flo a fluorescence. Uh, that is the formation of white patches. Oh, oh no, no, no. It's green. A lot of times it's green, and black, the wood like algae. Like yeah. ring, uh -huh. it, it will be like a ring ring. Like yep, yep, uh, yep. That is small. Yep. The wood, if uh -huh. you see, you, you can find it. It's the organism that grows and they like like uh, uh, wet, yeah, from that wet environment, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. So it's it's very common in in I think even for concrete structure, right? If you build on a flood plain, yeah. Okay, so those are the critical questions that you you need to be uh, aware of. Okay. Now, masonry structure, especially brick buildings, uh, the investigation can be challenging because uh, it a lot of times related to the manufacturing, okay? The, the brick work, whether it's done well or not, okay? So using very, very good uh, technicians are very important, the masons, okay? And uh, many, again, many of the problems, pool construction, you know, will show will show over time, okay? So to distinguish whether that was from the beginning or something new for a particular case uh, becomes very, very challenging. And also the, the, 
destination of blames also very difficult. Yeah. Okay, so these are the, the different problems, and you will get this in your notes, okay? Uh, timber structures, so we already covered a little bit about timber structures, but the timber type of structures, one of the big challenges, especially uh, in this uh, extreme climate, you know, extreme hot days and the very cold days, in, in, in where, where I live, you know, the daily differential of temperature can be as big as 50 degrees. Okay, you know, in the at night very very cold. In the morning very very hot. You know, so sometimes I wear short pants in the morning and then long pants at night, and and so in those kind of environment, it's actually more damaging than than here because your weather is all warm throughout the day, and uh, you know, your summer season dry. It's very dry. You know, so your mat your building material actually experience less damaging process than what we have, okay? And so, one of the problem with wood is it, it shrinks and it expands, okay, during the, the moist, based on the moisture on this. So we have a lot of devices that you can buy. Uh, so, you know, because uh, wood construction is not considered engineering, okay, unless it's a big structure, uh, we have a lot of devices that are av available in any of the uh, tool store two shops, okay, so anybody can buy those. And so you quickly realize that unless you are experienced with those devices, uh, you're not necessarily an, ex an expert, okay. So uh, so sometimes when, when I have to do a wood inspection, I will use the typical moisture gauge that they sell at uh, local workshops, but then I also will need something specialized such as uh, infrared camera. So I can scan, you know, scan the wood itself and see if there's any secondary information that can be combined. Okay. Actually, they removed the banner on the other day. Oh yeah, so probably another function. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. And so next is connection. So all structural systems are connected by bolding, cementing, or you know, welding, you know, depends on material, right? So uh, if it's a connection failure, then it becomes really tricky. Should the lawyer engage a uh, structural engineer or should he engage somebody who specializes, you know, like a steel fabricator who, very, who do this on a very daily basis, okay? So it, it becomes tricky how your technical team is represented, okay? But if you have a choice, as an expert, you know, to build out your team, you should definitely involve somebody who's a welder, for example, okay, if you're doing welding. Because in, uh, especially for steel structures in the U.S., uh, welding has to be inspected by uh, somebody who's doing NDT. And they make a lot of money, okay, because they need certificate from the American Society of Non-Destructive Testing. You know, so they have certificate one, two, three, and they were able to tell is this a butt weld joint or you know groove joint, and then how well is the joint done, and then they can do uh, magnetic particle scans to see if there's any cracks in the joints. Okay, how about the uh, the heat process zone on the uh, on the the base material? Okay, so they were able to do all this as assessment, and so that particular area of expertise, these guys are doing inspection all the time. So they are naturally a forensic expert, okay? But they can only do welding, okay? And so if you, as a structural engineer, you, you will never have that qualification. I mean, I can even tell even now that you will never have that qualification, okay? We have a lot of students who were hired by uh, steel fabrication companies, but you know, when they say, oh, I want a, 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 a second license for ultrasound, the company will ask why, you know, you're a structural engineer, you're hired to do structural design analysis, welding is not your job, okay, and so when you are engaging one of those jobs, make sure that you, you get somebody who's uh, licensed in ultrasound or uh, particle, magnetic particle in scans, 
be part of your team so that they can give you information. Okay, but also keep in mind they are giving you their assessment, their opinion, and it's still up to you to qualify whether that opinion actually is the real cause of failure. Okay, so again, when you have, for example, a, a catastrophic collapse of a building, the welding failures will not be the only cause. There's always something else, okay? Especially for existing structures, okay? That building has failed because of something else, okay? One connection, they would, if it were to fail, it would have failed before the building was being used, okay? During construction, it would have already happened, okay? So those are critical. I have, uh, we have done one case where we do all the inspections, so it was a bridge case. It was not failure, okay? But we inspect all the connections. It is, it is actually a bridge, a hybrid bridge. So it's a, a strong, high-performance steel plus normal-performance steel welded together, okay? So it's a very unique kind of design, and the welding has to be specially qualified, okay? And when we went back and do all the inspections, it all passed the design requirement, okay? So we were like, okay, this bridge will not have any problem. We, we go away. And then uh, it was during a professional meeting. Somebody know about the bridge construction process, come to me and tell me, hey, did you know that when they were erecting that bridge, they dropped the girder on the ground? You know, they were picking it up and then put it, and then suddenly it dropped. And then they pick it up quickly and then, yes. <laughs> you know. So I, I was suddenly shocked because, uh, you know, how would you know, you know, when they put it? But, but high performance still, the biggest issue with them is one hot heat. You know, if there is fire on the bridge, then that, that, the behavior of that kind of steel become very, very brittle. Okay, compared to normal steel. And the other thing is, it has steel, all kind of steel, if you have a strong impact, even if the exterior has no observable deformation, it has residual stress already built in. Okay, and those residual stress will eventually lead to fatigue failure. If, you, if, if I had not known something happened during construction process, I would never have suspected that if the bridge will collapse, that may be the one of the cause. Okay, so those are are just just uh, fascinating facts and uh, events that happens throughout the entire construction that you would never know, you know. And so now, you know, many times after every time I drive under the bridge, <laughs> look out, make sure nothing suddenly collapsed. But you know, that was intuition. But also, I mentally recognizing that uh, if one day the bridge, you know, God forbid, fell and people die, they will call everybody that related to that project. And I would definitely be called because I was, I, I certified the bridge. I'm claiming that all the connections had no problem, okay? So, you know, if the bridge collapsed and somebody claimed that the welding was a problem, then I'm, I'm gonna be blamed, okay? So you have to always, Keep in mind, you know, and, and that is why um, I always tell my students, okay, a lot of people were saying, you know, I mean, life is life, right? Going through your life, you, you have many, many things. Uh, I have a lot of students, in American students, they, you know, the biggest thing in their life is girlfriend. You know, I mean, seriously, I have students who will not come to class because, oh, my girlfriend is sick. And I would tell them, I said, you know, actually in your life, the, probably the most important thing, if you consist, insist being a civil engineer, is your professional career. Yeah. Even family may not be as important. Why? Because anything you screw up in your life, it's not just you. Your career is gone. Somebody's life will be gone. Okay, even in 2007, when I first came here, I asked everybody a question. Why is a civil engineer not making as much money as a doctor, medical doctor? You know, the Bible says there were two kings. Saul kills thousands and, and I mean, hundreds, and David, uh, and David kills thousands. So 
David is a bigger king, right? So civil engineers, if you screw up, you kill more people than the medical doctor. Shouldn't you be? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just one person's uh, opinion. But you know, seriously, your job is so important. Okay, so important that you know people don't appreciate what we do. Yeah. So, anyways. Okay, so uh, there are, and this is this is one of the the challenging part. Okay, so if I were to take you to an existing building and show you what they have, can you tell me right away if that is a a, a, a moment resistant steel connection or not? Maybe not. Okay, because there are two two critical aspects. One is it was after the uh, 1992 North Ridge earthquake that we start to distinguish between what kind of welding design is actually moment resistant for earthquake, obviously, and what is the simple connection, okay? And uh, before 1992, everybody pretty much designed based on their, you know, this is what I think is the, the moment resisting design. Okay, that is our opinion. Right? That's how we perceive. But actual structure that was built, we don't know whether it actually resists any kind of moments. Okay? And so being able to do analysis on a, a particular kind of connection that you just see for the first time becomes really, really important. Okay? And uh, is it really a pin pin? Is it fixed fixed? Well, in real life, it's probably neither. It's something in between, okay? And, and for many of you who had the uh, structure event structure analysis where, you know, you, you're designing for, you know, indeterminate structures, how indeterminate is the structure becomes really, really critical, okay? And uh, so being able to continue to refine your uh, analysis technique is also something that professionally you should be able to do, okay? And then, of course, steel to concrete connections, that is even more complicated for us to, to because most of the time, the connection part is probably encased in, in concrete. Yeah. How can we differentiate pinned and fixed in between connections? So you, you do both analysis, and then you kind of extrapolate or interpolate the answers in between. Yeah. And especially in those kind of cases, if possible, do a mock-up analysis. Or testing, so you build a connection kind of like what's in the field, and then test them in the lab until to the degree that you are happy with the uh, the the result. Yeah, usually those are more expensive projects. Okay, and uh, whenever we are involved those kind of projects, it will not be a single client. Okay, the request may be coming from the underwriter's lab, which is the insurance company. So they will require that uh, you be involved. You may have to test 50 of those connections you know, in various designs. And that, that's a good time to hire graduate students to do all the work. Yeah. OK, but yeah. So you re quickly realize that you know, as a forensic expert, your, your client may not necessarily be just one, one entity. OK, depend on how famous you are, how well recognized you are. Sometimes there are, there are money coming from other aspects, OK? Um, some big, big companies may engage you. And we will be talking about the business end. There are some, uh, in, at least in the US and Euro England, I know that there are some companies that are specialized in just forensics, OK? And you know, we're talking about 1,000 people, 1,000 engineer, big company, they do this. Because th there's a, the money in it is big. Okay. Any time a failure happens, you know, you, it could be a million, multi-million dollar lawsuits. And those are the jobs that those big companies are interested in. Okay. Uh, just furthermore, okay, precast members and so forth. So you have all this in your notes. Okay. Uh, so uh, tension structure is also another very critical element. My past experience with uh, pre-tension or post-tension uh, structure system, the problem is always water intrusion. 
Okay, because you know once they pre-stress and then they build up the system, it the, the the you cannot go back and tell what is the stress level in the tendons. Okay, unless it's post tension, they they actually can mount uh, low gauge. Yeah, but but and and that is why this kind of uh, analysis becomes very very challenging. Okay, and very expensive to to prove. Okay. Uh, but there are also interesting NDT techniques that are being developed. Okay, so there is a company that I work closely. They actually using magnetic effects on the pretension members to determine what is the uh, stress level. Okay, but then there is also, especially a company um, called uh, CRI. CTO, CTO, they used to be part of PCA, uh, Poland Cement Association, and now they become an independent company. But they, they, many years ago, they sponsored a, a PhD student just study if we vibrate the cable and then based on the the frequency change, if we can tell the pre-stress level, you know. So it's kind of like the device that I I introduced last week that calculate Based of the cables, okay, but uh, that that is a very difficult technique again. Uh, but but so if you were involved in a case where, for example, if you if you suggest using the electromagnetic principle, and then the other company used the vibration based results, then you're you become the competing of two technologies. Okay, and and that become very interesting because now you're going into li literally an area that you know only the top top experts can comment on this kind of uh, issue because now you're really competing two different technology. Okay, uh, usually if that were the case, then you need definitely contact people wherever you can find. Okay, so my understanding for pre-stress bridge at least. 20 years ago, there are only three or four groups worldwide that has experience of testing pre-stress bridge vibration. Okay, um, one group was in uh, Chile, the country Chile. Okay, so I I know that gentleman quite well. Uh, but but other than and, and then there's an Italian group, there's a Spanish group, there's an England group. You know, then you quickly realize that this this may be something that you cannot just base upon getting experts to debate, okay? Because it becomes so expensive to get a foreign expert to come. Um, in those cases, you may have to communicate to your lawyer, okay? Let's do something else, okay? Let's not go into that argumentative component because you will come to no end, okay? And then there are some areas where you absolutely have no expert. Then what do you do? You know there are some topics that either you don't know who the expert is, or you know you there is just no real experts in in the world. Those are usually cases that are debated and over and over. So again, our job as the uh, forensic investigator and the forensic experts, your job is not to define the scope of the work. The lawyers define the scope. Okay, your job is within the scope. Do the best you can to ascertain the accuracy of your causation analysis. Okay, and then after that, that's it. You know, there's not more than you can do for the case. Does that make sense? So, be mindful that you will not always win all cases. Okay, it, it's an ego that we all have. Okay, that I'm involved in this project. I know I'm an expert. I think I will win the case. No. Not always, okay? So keep that in mind. Lose or win is not something that you can control, okay? Many times you lose a case not because you're not expert enough or in your investigation is not good enough. There may be some totally different reasons, okay? So keep that in mind. Uh, when my advisor, my master's advisor, who is kind of like my mentor, um, when he passed away, and 
you know, I miss him, so I was on the internet looking up his information, and I, I, I saw a case study. So he actually lost a lawsuit, okay? And uh, there were people on the internet actually criticized him, you know, saying, oh, Dr. Moulton is, you know, didn't do this case study right, and, uh, but it's not, you know, I, I know him, I know how, how, uh, how, how strong technically he is, okay? You need to understand that as a defense lawyer, you have to have thick skin. It's okay if you lost a bunch of cases, okay? It happens, okay? It will not affect your business. Why? Because you are building up a, a, a reputation of, I'm not biased, okay? I do what I can within my area of expertise to defend my case, and that's all you need to do. Okay, and so that that is a, a, a very important lesson. Okay, and another thing very important. So this is a good time to to communicate. I'm hoping that uh, there will be more uh, forensic organization in India. Okay, because you need as as I described throughout the, the lecture, you need to have colleagues of different expertise so that when you have a case, you can call upon people, you know, make the connection, okay? So having that kind of uh, uh, a connection is extremely important, okay? But uh, it, it, it doesn't come easy because having a group of people meeting regularly takes time, takes money, takes efforts, okay? But need to start some point. I, I think... Babu from uh, IIS is trying very, very hard for the geotech. I don't know how much has been done for the structures group. I think the ACI Indian chapter in Mumbai has done a lot of work through RICA. But after he passed, I don't know who is doing that work. You know? So it, it's, a, it's a professional responsibility for all of us okay, to be involved in, in this kind of efforts. And hopefully, maybe one day, there's an Indian Journal of Forensic Engineering. Then you'll be publishing case studies and investigation methods and so forth for Indian-specific construction structures and so forth. And, and, and those will be very, very important professional contributions from uh, you know, maybe people from this group. Okay? But, but those are the, the things that, that needs to be done. Otherwise, this profession in India will not have any credibility. Okay, so th those are very, very important aspects of uh, what we do. Okay, so so uh, this particular uh, going through, you know, it's all in your notes. Okay, uh, the next thing is so. Uh, I wanted to show some pictures from our investigation in the Philippines. And this is really important because, you know, as far as my experience is related, most of our civil works in U.S. does not translate to other countries because most of our buildings are wood buildings, okay? Even for five, six stories, we're still made of wood, okay? Uh, but Philippines are mostly masonry structures, so this, this uh, would, would be pertaining to you guys, okay? Uh, and you can notice that this is a steel framed wood wall structure, okay, with masonry columns. Uh, but the, the we, inside is all steel roofing, truss roofing, and so forth. It's a very common design technique in, in uh, the Philippines. Okay, now, this particular structure, you can see that it's completely demolished, okay, by, by a strong hurricane. But as I described, you know, is this fell because of water or, you know, strong wave or because of wind? Okay, this structure is two kilometers away from the coast. We cannot imagine the wave come this far. Okay, so this particular structure is definitely wind damaged. But how did, how did it happen is the, the big question, yeah. Okay, and then this particular structure is actually not very far. You can even see the ocean in the background. So this building, it's a basketball court, okay? So in, in Philippines, playing basketball is very popular, okay? 
unlike here cricket and uh, soccer, right? But over there, it's all basketball. So we see tons of these basketball courts. So it's a wide span, strong roof system, right? So when if the building collapses, then the roof will come down, guaranteed, okay? And so in this particular case, you can tell it is both wind and water damage. Why? This is watermark, okay? This is what we call watermark. So the paint, because of the seawater intrude, so over time, it starts to peel. Okay, and so you can tell. In fact, uh, it's not very scientific, but I can look at this and say, oh, the water was probably was this high to the structure. Okay, so then the question is, you know, the collapse of this structure, is it due to water or due to wind? Okay, it turns out our conclusion, it may be both. Why? Because the uh, once the roof comes down, the roof is probably coming down because of the... Uh, the wing, okay? But uh, if the wall starts to come, oh, what did I do? Okay. Hmm. If, if the wall starts to come down, then it will bring the roof down as well, okay? And so in this case, we see a lot of water damage, especially the entrance gate. You know, the, the water was so strong, it just pushed it completely over, okay? So part of the wall was actually collapsed uh, because of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the 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 wave the wave was very strong. In fact, uh, we because you're not there, you don't know what, how high was the wave. But the analysis that we have done, the wave at this location is probably more than ten feet. In other words, three four meters high. So that is a lot of force. Keep in mind, water has eight times the the density of air. Okay, so if you have wave comes in, wave are very very powerful. Okay, and then uh, these are roof tile analysis. So, so we are looking, this gentleman here is actually trying to see how strong was the connection of those tiles. So those tiles are connected to the, to the uh, roof by a hook in the back. Okay, and so if it's not done properly, you know, then they will be easily uh, filled. So this, is, this has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, strength of the roof, but this would give us some indication of how strong the wing was, okay, at, at least at this particular location, okay. And then again, the, the yellow tape application, okay, so we put this, we were able to go back and calculate all the length of the columns, okay, and, and maybe even describe how bad is this uh, corrosion-induced crack, okay. And this roof is completely gone. This definitely is due to wing because it's a sheet metal roofing, okay? But uh, the rest of the, the wood truss, uh, other than, and other than uh, you know, some danglings, uh, most of them are still intact, okay? So that you can back calculate based on the time the structure was designed, the design code, and then back calculate what was the potential force on this system, okay? And uh, this is a, a building that was very close, a one-story building. So the wave was very high. So is the wave that pushed the roof down, or you know, or, or was it the wing? Becomes really, really critical to to understand. Now, um, one of the uh, in the climate study, especially for a tropical storm. Right now, people are very interested in understanding what happened between water and air. So the air-water interface are, are something that we don't fully understand, okay, even today. And from, from both big scale and the small scale sense, okay, so when the wave comes and he impacts on one of those structures, especially for cyclone, usually the wave travel very, very far, okay. So for the Bay of Bengal here, you know, the wave may be coming all the way from Bangladesh, you know, so they travel, they carry a lot of energy, and being able to sustain such a high storm surge, you know, such a high wave height, that means it has a lot of energy, okay? But what happened to right on top of that? You know, what is the wing scenario on top? Is something very difficult to, to, to quantify, okay? Because the wing is just keep pushing and keep pushing, but, but when it impacts on this structure, 
that that interface becomes extremely critical. You know, if we have to go into very fine detail in understanding, and and right now there is no no software that can analyze that kind of uh, behavior. Okay, because it's a very it has both random and uh, periodic components, steady state components. Uh, this building again near the ocean and and uh, uh, Bardi is very familiar. He has seen this picture numerous times. Uh, so uh, many of this analysis was actually done here at NITT. Okay, so we we uh, recently pop well not recent. Two, 2016, 17? Yeah. two years. Yeah, so we published the, a lot of this analysis work. Okay, and I'll describe some of this. Okay, and you can see this entire uh, this long span. Uh, building is all commercial and all the roofs are gone, okay? But though these roofs are sheet metals, okay? And the, the, the flood was go all the way to the top of this level. So, you know, again, people are questioning, is that wind damaged or water damaged roof, okay? Actually, you know, I don't think we can make that conclusion because if it's wind damage, it will most likely be uh, you know, so for example, if there's 10 of them, wind damage will usually be because of a downdraft wind, okay? So they will be peeling randomly, okay? And not completely, completely, that will be a wind speed of, I don't know, 300 kilometers per hour, very strong wind, okay? But if it's just uh, based on this scenario, the wind should be just jumping from the roof, okay? So it will be peeling one, two, three. But if it's a wave, it will most likely wash all of them. But because by the time we get there, this has already been cleaned up. So many of them maybe just damaged and just re peeled, uh, teared it off. So we cannot make that conclusion for this, okay, this case, yeah. And then uh, uh, another significance about particularly this storm is the Google Earth were actually able to publish data a month after the storm. So they have people, they collected all the people's uh, high resolution aerial imaging, and then they, they, they put it on Google Earth. So we actually were able to look at a building before the storm and then after the storm, okay, and then make an, a quick assessment on, on those structures. This is a technique that we are now developing and call it the roof, uh, the blue top analysis. Okay, because the U.S. practice, especially for coastal areas, when the storm hits a structure, uh, the government will provide them blue tiles to, to put on top of the blue tops that put on top of those roofs. So when Google people fly over, you, you can see if the, blue, the roof becomes blue, that means there's a roof damage. Okay, uh, and uh, you can base on that and do geospatial analysis. Okay, so this is a, a building very close by, and it's a, a four units combined, you know, attached system. So if you go around the building, you quickly realize that, wow, you know, this foundation has already been damaged. Okay, so wave goes under scour the, uh, the foundation, so the foundation has disappeared in this area. And then, uh, but the... You can see how far it intrudes. It didn't go all the way through the building, okay? And uh, part of this, uh, this uh, pavement still remains, okay? And this is another view. So you, you go in here, and then you have to ask yourself, so this building is on a cliff, okay? A uh, uh, 20 meter tall cliff. So we believe the wave has reached that far, so they underscore the, uh, the building. Okay, and these are very important data because uh, one of the challenge, is especially now we see a lot of those extreme storms, is that most of the buoys for for um, air, uh, the ocean current and the wave analysis are damaged, so you don't have real data to support. So you have to do this post analysis, especially forensic work, give you the ground truth of exactly what is the wave height. Okay, uh, because uh, you don't get any other data. Okay, and then uh, uh, just more views. And then you also have uh, wind damage. So this roof, uh, is it because of the wave impact and then broke the tiles or because of wind broke the tiles becomes very interesting 
probably more philosophical, rhetorical questions rather than scientific. Okay, but uh, we we do a lot of those analysis. So uh, when we do the analysis, it becomes very interesting. So uh, during uh, 2014, almost every day, because I have one student, Joe, in America. So we do real time uh, communication. So 8 p.m. their time is 8 a.m. our time. We'll be sitting in the civil engineering department. Uh, and then we'll use Skype and discuss with Joe, you know, what happened here because he's the uh, manager of the database. So we were we were going through this every day, and then everybody uh, will just discuss. Okay, is this this damage? What is this cause? And then collectively we come to an agreement. You know, this is what happened. Okay. So so this kind of analysis is getting more and more uh, popular. In fact, after Haiti earthquake. Uh, I work with a company. We actually engaged uh, 500 different universities worldwide. The, the company, this was before Google has this kind of capability. So he developed a, soft, uh, a, a database on the internet. And people can go in and then give quick assessment of what happened at Haiti. Because it's very important for the government to know right away how bad is the condition. And then being able to come up with a number, a dollar amount, okay, what is the, the damage to, to us, okay? And uh, in, the, in the Philippine case, I think they, they wasted three months because they couldn't get to the site. So nobody helped them to do that kind of analysis in order to go to United Nations and, and request help, okay? Because people are willing to help, but you have to tell them how much. But, uh, you know, so this kind of analysis has its value. In fact, there are many companies that are actually become specialized in this kind of analysis. And I will describe more um, Wednesday on this topic. Okay. And this is uh, some study. So I describe this is uh, very close to NIT Trichy that we, we went in. The, so the cranes were is moving back and forth, and then you create some kind of vibration. They don't really know what caused the vibration. So we went and do some analysis. Uh, this is, is that you, Baladi? You're on. <laughs> so yeah, he was up there with one of their uh, technician. And then they, they physically see how the, the crane moves and so forth. And uh, this is some detail of the, the guide way for the, 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 the crane. OK. so. Something happened when the crane goes through connections and then suddenly, bing, it will, it will have a straining. And then it causes the, the whole crane system to shock. The whole building would boom, okay? And so uh, we, we look at the details of all this connection. And surprisingly and not surprisingly, you know, the, uh, the, the bolts and the are not always, you know, exist, okay? And so, uh, but this gives you a sense of the scale of the uh, the system, I think maybe 15 meters tall, yeah, about 15 meter tall structure, yeah, and and so this is the the bottom of this. So it's a very very wide columns, a very unique design. And this is my cell phone. So I use the software that I demonstrated. We we stick it to the wall and then move the crane and then measure the vibration on that. Yeah, see. You can see some really, really big when it close to where that connects. So we were able to identify which column has the most vibration. Okay, we didn't do a very detailed uh, analysis because this data I cannot download, so I cannot do any dig digital signal processing. But it would be interesting to do so. And this is the entire facility. Okay, as 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 we seen um, at the time. Okay. And so what are the, the tasks performed? So we went in there and we do a very systemic uh, scanning using the, my cell phone, okay, on, and identify where are the critical damage area. Okay, now, we don't have to do so much work, right? Because if you talk to the technician, he would tell you, oh, this is, I see it every day, this is the problem, okay? But why do we do this? Because you want to be system, okay? So you do some extra work 
so that you can have a data that backs you up. Okay, and and this is always one of the uh, challenge as an investigator because the guy will be like you. You know, you're not very smart. You hire an engineer, not very smart. I already told him the problem. But he still insists on going through everything that I already told him. Well, because you don't want to be biased, okay, and you wanted to, to be able. So, you know, you, you have to communicate to them, this is why I'm doing this. I'm not causing you any extra trouble, you know. But, but, but I wanted to be scientific, systematic, okay. Now, on the other hand, that case was, uh, I don't think they pay us. Did they even buy dinner for us? No. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it was uh, pro bono work. So pro bono is a word that we learned during the learning the legal language, Latin language. Pro bono means you do it for free. Okay, so... so for your information, that company is now... Uh, gone. Gone. <laughs> uh, a series of uh, labor issue, yep. payment issue. Uh-huh. Uh, Financial... It became very critical. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. no orders. Uh, it's in the full of... Uh, did they sell it to another company, or they just I, I got it? I think so. I don't know. What okay, because other than the 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 plan here, they have another big plan for for wind, doing the wind wind tunnel, right? I mean, not tunnel, tunnel, wind tower. That place is completely obsolete. Oh it's my a, goodness! Yeah, it's nothing now. Mm -hmm. so yes, uh, completely, completely gone. Completely yeah. No. So you know this this is really uh, sad. You know, it's it's a big industry, yeah. Not but but because of this, uh, they were all full of dependent with this BHL uh, works. Ah, BHL is now changing. in decision time, and mm -hmm. uh, they don't have any much orders. Yeah. So because of that, these companies are suffered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The they have uh, almost ninety five percent of the orders from BHL. Really? Oh my goodness! Yeah. So it's very pathetic. Yeah. Very very sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you you realize that you know the um, the steel industry is very cutthroat, very very yeah. I have a friend who owns a steel fab, and uh, he survived through the 2008 to 2010 cycle. We meet every week, and uh, you can see he hair gray, so much stress, you know, be 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 his owner yeah, but he was able to survive. So we lost. 2008, the, the, the depression, well, we don't call it the, the economic downturn. I don't think anybody called it depression. But the economic downturn actually caused Charlotte. 80% of the steel companies closed. The small, small companies all closed. So only few big companies, and my friend survived. Now he has many, many jobs. Suddenly, you know, so he's like, can, do you have students who want a job? You know, because I, I have more jobs than I can handle. Yeah, so this, yeah, it's a very cutthroat business. But, well, <laughs> so the, hey, this become a archived project. Okay, but anyway, so we, we uh, were able to, f to do the investigation and we found that the conclusion is the loud, dumb noise was actually coming from the sheet metal, okay? The roofing on the top and the wall because of the, 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 the frame, okay? So it's not really coming from the crane going through this connection, but because of that jump, the, the vibration force, that big noise coming in and scare everybody. So it's not structural. There's no structural problem. But nonetheless, we still uh, give them some recommendation, such as we suggest that they should have cross bracings, you know, on the top and the bottom. That would make the frame system rigid, and then the vibration would not cause the sheet metals to, to vibrate, absorb, yeah, absorb the, the shock energy. Okay, so these are, uh, are the kind of analysis and uh, evaluations that you would do as a forensic engineer, okay? And of course, uh, would you do otherwise? Your opinion, how would you do if somebody come to you and ask you for this case? Especially if your cell phone cannot measure vibration. How would you do this case? Speak up, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> a good, easy solution. Yeah, buy a smartphone so that at least you can download the app and measure vibration. Yeah, but uh, if I were to do this at home, 
I will definitely take all this and then I will do uh, uh, signal processing and know which mode of vibration. Okay, so this job in my mind could have done even more, you know, by by doing a full full scale analysis. Okay, and so that way you can even tell, you know, where exactly is the the critical connection. So, you know, we suggesting that they they embrace the frames. Okay. That is one way, but the other way actually would be easier is to find how is the sheet metal connect to the to the frame, okay? And so if you can stiffen the sheet metals without stiffen the the frame, you save them a lot of money, okay? Because this cross spacing will be a, a a significant project for this building, but if they can just go in there and add a few more hooks to the sheet metal and not doing any extra work. That would be the cheaper solution. No, this yeah. uh, this sort of vibration mm. is occurred only in this particular location, or uh, even somewhere when we even somewhere. even somewhere even somewhere. even somewhere. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. when this junction it comes, we get the vibration. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. It's yeah. not focused on the center no. or in the uh, closer to the support no. side. Yeah. It's not no, no, it's not. Yeah, it was almost definitely coming from the top. You know, uh, so we we couldn't go in and look at because the room is dim. Yeah, dim. right. Yeah, that's another thing. Uh, hindsight. If I had a, a telescope at that time, I may be able to pinpoint and see when the the crane goes through a connection, it it either jump or you know something happened. But we don't have that uh, facility at that time. Okay. Because so because yeah. of the span, uh huh, uh, that might cause some. Did, did we uh, did we do any uh, span length analysis? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. If it dips, yes. yeah, maybe yeah, maybe the mm, possible, yeah, possible. Uh, all these uh, channels are stiffened, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so this is this is the only connection stiffening, and then they are fixed on the onto the columns. Yeah. Well. By by uh, suggesting this kind of bracing, we are also address that issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Might be the section, whatever might be designed, uh, it could have it could have widened. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. If the width is quite uh, large enough, yeah. than that of the provider. Right. I think we can would have arrested this sort of this kind of shock. In yeah. In one uh -huh. sort of. The right. I seem it seemed to be very. Uh, Little thinner, mm -hmm. comparatively. right? Yeah. The girders. The yeah, that's a that's a good point. So based on the experience, you look at the uh, the uh, the the columns and the frames. It could be built a little thicker Thick. than yeah, mm -hmm. using a, a thicker plate. Yeah. But again, with an existing structure such as this, you know, any of the repair work will be post construction and it will, will be very Prices. But I have I never had been to this industry. Okay. So, uh, uh -huh. uh, once we met the owner on the way when we were crossing ahead yeah. of toll, uh -huh. uh, he came to meet C and sir. Yes. That okay. He introduced me. He's the owner. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I don't remember his name, but I can still remember his face. <laughs> Older gentleman. Okay. Now. This is the I thirty five bridge. Okay. So I know some of you may have follow the uh the the event you know it it was kind of old by now okay but uh it is one of those case studies uh that is carries extremely significance as far as engineering so the uh, from a design perspective it's a 40 years old bridge okay and they were just you know built after the civil bridge collapse, okay, so the civil bridge is a uh, bridge in West Virginia. The bridge, that bridge, because of its collapse, uh, many things happened, okay. One of the most important thing is American federal mandate that every bridge on the highway system need to be inspected every other year. So before, I think it was 1971, uh, there was no requirement for bridge inspection. Okay, it was after the civil bridge collapsed, then we have this mandate. And then, lo and behold, 40 years after that bridge, the, which is the trust bridge, okay, and then now you have another trust bridge that collapsed, collapsed, okay. 
And uh, in this case, uh, it's a 14 span, 1,900 feet long, okay? And then there are 466 similar bridge in the U.S. So we know how to design this bridge pretty good, okay? And we, we know the problem with this kind of bridge, okay? In fact, this particular, particular bridge, as I described uh, last week, that it has gone through its two-year cycle of inspection. And they have mandated that now the bridge is so old, it needs to be inspected every other year. And the DOT has already told, you know, contract to have the bridge repaired, okay? So, you know, by the book, how can this bridge collapse? It's beyond imagination, okay? Well, these are the uh, failure mode. So the post, and, and the reason we know those are, they did a, a full-scale final element simulation of the failure collapse. And that's how they found out those are the, the weak connections, okay? But being weak connection doesn't mean the bridge you know, fell because of the weak connection. Okay, so what happened is, so this is the existing bridge. I mean, the, 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 before it was damaged, okay. This is the scenario on 2007. You can see the traffic on the bridge, okay. And the construction activity was in such a way that they actually put a lot of the construction materials on the bridge. You have a lot of dead load. And then the traffic sitting there, another additional dead load, okay. And uh, as a result, they believe that the connections on the U10 is where it fell. Okay, so this is the detail of the construction. Okay, and they believe that it was the boating, the rivets that fell. Okay, and in fact, they did uh, stress analysis. Okay, so they can cal tell, calculate at the time of collapse how much of those uh, connect joints are overstressed. Okay, and uh, this is further. And then uh, another thing is the gusset plates. So the gusset plates again indicates why they are weak. Okay, so this this one is uh, the red are all only half inch thick. Okay, so why are they not using the same thickness plates? It's beyond our understanding. You know, it doesn't make sense. Why why do you want to specify different? Why don't you just build them all uniform? Okay. And the investigation was done by the National Transportation Safety Board, which is part of the NIST, National Institute of Standard Spectre. Testing. Yeah. And they investigate the collapse. And then there are many other. So because this is a high-level incident, okay, national-level incident, so the federal government, the national government come in and do their in the investigation, but they are not the litigators, okay? The lawsuit is between the the families, okay, against the state, against the contractors, against the architect, against the engineering firm that built. Okay, so there are many parties of so the state by by law did their own investigation and then there are different so when we discuss about this case, several of our colleagues were involved in the case, hired by different parties. Okay, so you quickly realize that this, in this case, there are many, many people who do. And then there are several people who do their own independent, like university faculties did their own, and they, their intent was published the work, okay? And uh, there are, this is where the report is being published, okay? So, so there, there are, and, and uh, usually in this kind of cases, um, the NTSB's uh, investigation will be the last one to publish, okay? Because they uh, they present the national government present the final say of what happened, okay? And they will be collecting yours and everybody else's uh, investigation reports, and then they do the synthesis, and then they do the advanced analysis such as collapse analysis and so forth, and then they finally make a decision and say this is why we think the case, okay? Now. Just because NTSB published their work, okay, does not necessarily design, designate who is at fault in this case, okay? And, and you have to realize that in the court system, okay, the judge of the, the whoever the case was brought to, he has the final decision on designating 
guilt and blames and, and, and guilty parties. Okay? And so if he chooses to ignore this, he will give a strong reason. Oh, I don't believe in the N NTSB report. Why, why, why? You know, he will have a strong defense. Okay? But, but uh, many, many cases that the investigation being thrown out, either because there's a conflict of interest, there is some elements of questionable nature, such as induced bias and so forth. So there is a possibility that your investigation get thrown out of the door. Okay, and and so uh, do not again. You know, as a professional, you are not your job is not to dictate. Once you've done your investigation, once you've done your opinion forming, your job is done. Okay, and unless they call you in to question you, cross-examining you, you know, there's not much you can do about the case. Now the case is in the lawyer's hand, in the judge's hand, then they fight over, you know, what happened and so forth. Okay, so, on, you know, it, it, it is, um, again, this is a very fascinating profession. And, uh, you know, and, and again, like this kind of cases, you never know what's going to happen afterwards, okay. And this is the brand new bridge. Again, you know the 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 the, the comment from uh, 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 from from the famous Duke Engin uh, Duke University professor, you know, rep is is uh, Petrosky is always holds. You know, instead of going in and do a better trust bridge, they completely move away from trust bridge. Okay. There are a lot of human reasons behind, okay? But, but uh, another 40 years, we'll wait and see what kind of bridge will collapse, okay? And see if Henry Petrosky is correct, okay? <clears throat> uh, now I wanted to uh, discuss a li little bit about the uh, Mali Bakum case in Chennai. Okay, now, again, the the reason for bringing out this case is not to pass my opinion on the case, okay, but just to demonstrate the investigation. Oh, uh, never uh, maybe I didn't include the the YouTube on this, but after this, maybe you can help us record the YouTube, okay? So this is uh, eleven story, ten plus one building, okay. At the time of collapse, the building frames is all done, so it's actually two structures okay and uh, <clears throat> the two buildings are you know 90 percent completed and then suddenly in a very stormy night thunders big big uh, wings and and stuff and one of them collapsed okay the other one remains standing okay and this is what happened after the collapse so the interesting thing is the center of the structure, it's, so it's actually two buildings connected in between. Okay, that, that, that constitutes one structure. And the, uh, the other structure is identical. Okay, uh, have connections in between. And uh, when, when the collapse happens, the buildings kind of folds, unfolds like a lotus. And then one collapse with an angle and then, you know, very, very uh, clean, slated and the other one collapsed onto its side okay and so what happened here uh, there are you know conflicting questions okay and of course you need to to assign blanks okay which i think the the core of tamanadu has already decided yeah but uh, in regardless when you look at this picture you know the first thing that you should recognize is that the failure of this structure, the reason the, the building leaning on its sides, okay, tells you something about how this kind of system work, okay, and uh, it almost like a lateral force hit the structure, okay, and uh, not a very strong lateral force. So one of the things that that will be interesting is what is the actual stiffening effect, strength of the the the, the support against horizontal failure mode, okay? Because Chennai, I don't think, is a strong earthquake zone. So these buildings are not designed for earthquake, but it wasn't happening because of earthquake, okay? There's no, no earthquake at the time. So how did the building 
collapse in such a manner is a very fascinating thing to 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 understand. Okay. Oh. So I, I, I'm hope I hope this will work. Uh, Nominee, I need your help. Yeah. So I I wanted to show you several videos. Is it me or is it you? So did you copy all this? Oh no, actually I don't have the the video. I don't have the video on my laptop either. No, no, no. This is the the thing. I don't know why uh, why the video couldn't copy to uh, the Windows. Okay. 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 Let me let me show you this. So, in in our lab. Okay, I'm actually, at this time, I was on my sabbatical in Taiwan. So I engaged one of the universities to help me uh, to do this analysis. So what happens here is to simulate uh, strong and weak connections, we, uh, we build, use wood to make this kind of structure. And, and based on their design, you know that the, 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 uh, the, the, the stories are strong, right? I mean, the, it's a strong beam weak column case. So we put uh, weights on each of the story to, to simulate the, the, the dead load, okay? And then the connections are, we use a glue and a double-sided tape to represent strong bonding and weak bonding, okay? And then we use two different weights to, to impact on the, uh, the frame. Uh, maybe maybe the video on the the slide will automatically since now that we're connected. Yeah. Tell you what, it's probably easier to to look. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's no. No. That's the demolition. No, no, no. Go to another model. Welcome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Lightning failure. No, no. Another lightning failure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is the simulation. Okay. So it, um, I team up with a, a German group. And they are lighting experts, and then they engage this company that do particle physics analysis. So, uh, and this is available on YouTube. Okay, so you can see they model the structure as beams and uh, slabs. Okay, which you know, like we discussed, is this real? Okay, is this valid? Okay, uh, in at least in the U.S. Co co uh, co court that this will not be not necessarily be accepted okay because the the lawyer would argue hey this is you know you're not really study the actual behavior okay you just simulate but uh, this is the layout okay so those are the columns that they suggest that may have collapsed and then so they simulate okay those are the weak columns and then if the columns would collapse what will happen to the remaining of the building so they did numerous uh, simulations. So you can see this building. And then they, they do additional columns. Okay, so 
So when, when all those only four columns collapsed, the building was still standing. When more columns collapsed, the building was still standing. And then, okay, then suddenly something happened and collapsed. And this is a different viewpoint. So using this kind of simulation, it gives the client a very clear visualization of what happened. But as a forensic expert, you need to ask yourself the question. We know no simulation is 100%. Okay, so is there anything that people can attack this simulation? This is one of the things. If that, if that were the failure mode, the building would have gone into the other building and pushed the other building down. Okay? So that, you know, based on their analysis, they don't think that would be the case. So now they are simulating lightning strike on the structure. So they believe the lightning strike on the structure actually caused columns on the exterior to fail. Okay? So now they do the simulation. Notice that the failure mode has the, yeah, the buildings are almost parallel. But in reality, there was an angle for one part of the building. Notice that all the beam and columns fall as rigid members. Okay, so this is this can be one of the areas that people argue. Real life structures will not fail that way. Okay, but uh, this is actually quite consistent with the pictures. You know, so the connections between the columns and the beams are not strong. Okay, there's no. Again, you know, my question to you is that a moment resistant connection? It's not. Okay, and so the building collapsed. If you look at the the molyvolcom collapse pictures, the the beams are, I mean the columns are stick, literally straight as this. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, uh let me need, yeah. So that is uh, what um, what the uh, German has simulated, and uh, what I'm in my lab we're trying to prove, and and you have to understand our understanding of the the case, re involve you know, keep mentally thinking. And so we did the experiment. Uh, yeah. Oh, why are you ejecting your... Huh? Well, no, 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 this is the same movie, right? Yeah, yeah, this is... A, no. Oh, uh, this is just a picture. Movie is below, yeah. So, uh, oh, oh, hang on, yeah. No, no, those are, are just pictures. The one, the last one is the, the video. But anyway, let me show, let me explain to them. So, so uh, you can see that we put it on soil. We also simulate soil different stiffness, okay? So by, by, by different water content, okay? And sand and clay, okay? So we do many, many of these experiments. And uh, the, the 79 is a video, yeah. So Malibacom experiment, yeah. So that that ball is that sphere is our simulation of a horizontal whoop. Yeah, so you notice that by varying the weight of the ball, we can simulate different horizontal force, okay, for different connection. 
And uh, based on that, I can construct a uh, force versus column joint stiffness curve. Okay, and then determine what is the relative force level that will cause the building to collapse. And uh, the the argument here is that the the uh, we believe there is a horizontal force, whatever it is, happening between the two buildings. Okay, now. We know that wind cannot blow between the building and suddenly split waves, right? And then there's no earthquake. So it's got to be a, a totally different mechanism, okay? This contrasts completely from the, the, uh, the, 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 the federal uh, answer. or the, they, they claim that the contractors are poor in construction. You know, they use substandard concrete or whatever, yeah. Now, if that were the case, the building would have collapsed even before it was completely built. Okay, there's got to be a horizontal forcing of some kind, and the only explanation that I can accept is a German professor who suggests uh, electric hydraulic lightning strike caused that shock, horizontal shock that caused that. Other than that, I really cannot believe any other possible explanations. Okay, but of course. That is what our understanding to this point. There are more, more that we can. Okay, so can you demonstrate another one? Yeah. So this is the case where we use a bigger. Is this the same one or different? One? Next one. Okay. I think it's going. Is it going? Mm -mm. Oh, no, this is the same one. Yeah, the next one, yeah. See, it takes substantial, it's significant amount of force, okay? Still not as strong as uh, earthquake horizontal force or strong wind, but still there is horizontal force. Yeah. Any questions about this? Why did the other buildings not be Because it wasn't struck by lightning. That's my answer. The Germans? Right. That's what they suggest. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I'm not an expert in the electrohydraulic forcing, but the uh, the 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 German professor suggests because at the time of rain, the top of the building because it was not completed, so it traps a lot of water, and the rebars are still exposed, so the lightning hits into the water and trajectory towards the rebars, and then the lightning just strikes down throughout the entire structure. And unfortunately, you know, neither he nor I have the complete uh, story because the government has already removed all evidence. You know, so we can only base on what we do. So this is what I'm doing here is a good demonstration of a mock-up test. Okay, so you build up uh, either a model of the building and then demonstrate how it fell and, uh, you know, or use a numerical simulation to, to do so, yeah. And, and so the, is that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Go ahead. Is there any other cases like similarly what you have said? Yes, so there were, um, I mean, uh, lightning strike on structures is very common, okay, more common than, than you imagine. Okay, and that is why IEEE has very specific guidelines on buildings to uh, to to counter lightning strike. Okay, you always you always have to have a uh, protector of some kind. But this building is most unfortunate. It was in the process of being built. Okay, I I mean they cannot have imagined to have a protection then. But uh, if you look at the uh, the environment of Malivakum, this is the tallest building in that area, okay? And so 
if there's a lightning strike, most likely that will be the one that attracts. It's taller than any trees around, any buildings around. Okay, so, so the and then uh, he was able to look at the meteorological data that uh, during that time there were significant amount of there are multiple lightning strikes in that area during that time. Okay, so that is another evidence that from from my counterpart, uh, the German professor. Okay, so based on all this, we believe that the most likelihood of this building coming down is because lightning strike the building and then cause some kind of uh, explosion, a horizontal forcing that makes it opens up. But the column should have been uh, blasted, no professor? Yeah. When the lightning hits. Yeah, that, that's where the, the simulation guys go into more detail. But the actual picture, when yeah. we saw the collapse, uh -huh. it was not so. Yeah. The columns was not... Uh, you mean the middle? Yeah. Well, uh, so... Okay, so the lightning hits. Yes. It caused uh, an explosion kind of Correct. movement. Because and then uh, the it's, the beam, it's the beam that actually fell, not the column. You know, so, so my theory is there's got to be a shock wave. Okay, it cannot be just, just break, okay, a clean break. So there is a shock wave, and that's why the building collapsed. It might be, uh, when you see the column sizes are very... Uh, Thin. Again, the size is very, very uh, thin. Uh -huh. yep. uh, if at all, if they would have gone for another 100 mm extra, it uh, would may not function, have the same. It would have been uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, resisted, if right. that is the yeah. case. But, but so the question is, I, since I'm not familiar with Indian code, that kind of column design, is it sufficient for wing and earthquake in Chennai? In Chennai, it it will not be sufficient. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. I think that might be the thing. That might be the thing. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because so I haven't <laughs> seen for a such a high-story building with a such a, a thing. Size of but you know, if you go to Singapore, hmm. we have thirty-story buildings, also very thin column. Thin yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what actually, the actually, after the uh, Kobe earthquake and the the North Ridge earthquake, people going into thin column, strong beam design, because you wanted the building to sway. So you, 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 you benefit from the, the force release of the, the thin columns. Yeah. But again, yeah, I agree with you. Just looking at the geometrical, you know, I, I think another thing is the connection. They need to have moment connection, yeah. Because, uh, yeah, otherwise the beam was like little matchsticks Falling, yeah. In such thing as that, it would be behaved like an elastic right. uh, behavior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, you need to benefit. They would not have released that uh, moments. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, in this case, there's no almost very little moment resistance. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why all the columns were just buck, you know, just completely detached. But, uh, you told that the meteorological data, where yeah. the thunder has hit in many places. No, no, no. Uh, no, no. What he's saying is, in that region, because the uh, lightning data is not so high resolution, that region in that whole Malivakam area, there were many many lightning happened. Can we uh, choose the point where that lightning was very critical? No, no, we don't know exactly where. where. The 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 way that they get that is using satellites and actually record where the lightning, you know. So they only see the clouds with that sudden bright brightness, okay, yeah, intensity. To tell that is a lightning, but the specific point, no, yeah, not yet. Yeah. I think those are the points which the court uh, didn't accept, and they just told to demolish the yeah uh, the, the other building to, right for the yeah. safety point. Of yeah, they they demolish the other building, which is yeah. Still, I have one more. Question. Yeah. Right. The second building, yeah. that tells me how good the building was built. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, like World Trade Center, uh, the 9-11 World Trade Center, everybody's big question is, after the first building comes down, the second building comes down. So did the first building comes down create enough effect to cause the second building comes down? Same argument here, okay? If the first building comes down create enough shock, and bring the second building down, that means the building wasn't built very good. 
But because the first building comes down enough shock that didn't cause the second building comes down, that tells me it's a pretty good uh, constructed building. You know, I mean, it's not a straightforward logic, but does that make sense? Yeah. And so, in fact, I think uh, some locals suggest that they continue to use the second building because it's built, but the government decided to take it down. Yeah. Uh, but what safety point? I think it's pretty safe. It's proven it will not collapse. You know, and, okay, unless you next scared, lightning. They're, they're yeah. If something happens, they have to pay such it, a huge sum. But, but, but <laughs> in my opinion, that is not an engineering decision. That was a, just a political decision. Because engineering decision, I would go in and check that building to make sure it's safe. And then I would reuse that building. We can reinforce the building if you don't think the building is not safe enough, right? Engineer can go in and do that, uh, but they choose not to. It's it, such a waste it's of a money. Just, uh, uh, what is this, uh, it's a psychological fear. Yeah. Uh, the people <laughs> who have purchased the flats uh, at different floors. Uh, when we are living, when such sort of incident happen, what will happen? To yeah. Us? Uh, I mean, in, in my mind, that that second building is very good. You know, for a hundred years, nothing will happen <laughs> because it's already shown one calamity. It didn't get the effect. You know, but. Yeah, people who are not engineers don't think like engineer. Yeah, they scare when something happens. Uh -huh. uh, it is very, very closer. Right, uh, which has happened. So how long it will take to reach us? Yeah, uh, they will be having that sort of uh, psychological right. fear. Right. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah, but uh, like you were saying, if the columns were not big enough, let's add another hundred millimeter. I mean millimeter. Yeah, hundred mm. It maybe make it a stronger and better building. You know, there's no reason why you have to completely waste a uh, whole building. Yeah, you know. we could have done some external jacketing. Ex exactly, reinforcement. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the geotechnical data is fine, processor. Yeah, but, uh, no, I'm there's not, no. I'm not sure about yeah, we things. we also look at some of the geotech uh, data. So there is shallow rock. I heard it's a water log area. It's not a yeah, water yeah, yeah. It's it. It was a, a, it was a, a lake. lake yeah, it was a lake. So it has a lot of mud materials. But they have deep foundation. Okay. Yeah, they have okay. piles driven. Yeah, they have gone very deep. Even if it's not very deep, it wasn't. You know, the the foundation after they demolish, foundation didn't have any problem. Any problem. Yeah. Because so that sort of failure uh, didn't show any sort of. Uh, Settlement. Uh, right, no. Uh, yeah, there was no settlement. It's yeah, not or, a settlement. Yeah, it's not a differential Whatever settlement. The photographs which we saw, yeah. uh, that is clearly indicating that it is not a settlement. Failure. No, yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah. People are saying might be some settlement failure. No, uh, there uh, may be a liquefaction, liquefaction. But, but you know, with such a big building, it takes a long time for water to saturate and then cause liquefaction. Even liquefaction, you still need a horizontal Correct. force, right? Yeah. Otherwise, it will not move laterally. Yeah. The lateral failure mode is what's challenging here to explain. Yeah. If you have a, like a tower of pizza, you have differential settlements, the building will collapse in a totally different manner. Yeah. It doesn't even necessarily have to be you know, laid out such a neat way. Yeah. So, but uh, but that, you know, this is why forensics is such a fun thing. You, you see this kind of failure case studies. Everybody will have their own opi opinion, you know, and then we can discuss. And that's, that's what, what is fascinating. Yeah. But it takes a, a good forensic engineer to, to do the thorough analysis. And even in this case, I, you know, unfortunately, we will never be able to tell the whole story because they remove all the evidence. But yeah. what happened was uh, this sort of thunder failure I came across. Mm. One of the employee, yeah. a non-teaching employee in mm. this institute, uh -huh. uh, he's in the uh, back side of our institute, yeah. somewhere around 5 to 7 kilometers away. Okay. That's a small mm -hmm. village. Yeah. There was a thunder. Mm. So when the lightning and thunder hit, it has hit his slab. Oh. And his entire slab was, uh, roof slab was collapsed. Right. Oh. Uh -huh. His house. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That. Uh -huh. So uh, that's why when I was thinking, if the thunder would have heated, uh, the column should have at least. Uh, yeah. It should have uh -huh. burst. Yes. Because the thunder, uh, it absorbs when uh, due to that absorption, some yeah. some sort of right. So so come. so the uh, the German professor claimed that some of the rebar should have charred. Okay. 
blackened because of the, you know, when dandelion is like million watts of power, it would make the metal melt. Mm. So they should have signs of shard. But do we have any? No, have there's any nothing, like nothing left, unfortunately, yeah. Uh, Why don't we think about the liquefaction process in that way? Because, because no, no, liquefaction is, it is very, long. yeah. And, and also, most likely the two building will collapse this way or that way. Because it is, uh, the, uh, the second one was very adjacent to the first yeah. one. Uh -huh. uh, so if the soil profile of number one building is there, it number will two the will same. also the, the same. Will yep. be the same. Should have the same. Yep. It will not mm -hmm. suddenly change. Right, yeah. Uh, uh, I presume. No, 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 you are absolutely right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But uh, of course, you know, yeah. But I how can we judge this liquefaction process? Properly? Oh, how you can go back and look at if the two buildings, where are the rock, bedrock? But uh, based on what, uh, so I have the geotech data from Natarajan. And the, uh, the, the bedrock, on, it's very consistent. So if, if one building fell because of liquefaction, the other one should, should feel the same. Yeah, there is no reason they didn't, one sus sustained, the other one did not. Yeah, yeah so that, that's another reason why we don't think foundation is the problem. an interesting case but how somehow the government has uh, yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> right but but on, on the other hand you know the the government make their decision based on whatever and obviously there is no forensic input from the engineering industry okay and so if 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 uh, we were to have a stronger group in India maybe the group can have input and, and make recommendation to the government saying that, hey, you know, let's not do that. This is a very important case study, despite the, the, the sad nature. You know, we will preserve that evidence just for scientific investigation. And that will, that will be, you know, will benefit more people than they imagine. Yeah. Now, yeah, the, the Molly Vulcan case is very unique. I have not yet heard another high-rise building that collapsed because of lightning stroke. But, uh, you know, you never know. Because we do see more lightning, more significant lightning because of climate change, okay? And so you never know, maybe someday this kind of cases may happen, yeah. Any, any other questions? Yes. Yes, yep. Uh -huh. How you can verify there is a residual stress? Oh, so excellent question. Excellent question. So there is ultrasound method that can be used for highly uh, um, high residual stress, stress case. Excuse me, yeah. Yeah, because uh, the, the idea of having residual stress is that, you know, you, you build in a force field, okay? And so if you use ultrasound at high frequency, it actually the wave speed will change because of the stressing. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a that's an excellent question. Yep. Mm -hmm. How do you tell if there is something that is that's built into the system? Yeah, it's kind of same principle as pre-stress. So when you have a like a string, you, the more you tension the string, the higher the vibration will be. So a pre uh, a, a stressed steel member has similar effects built in. Yeah, yeah um, another important thing, especially in, in forensics uh, for structures, you know, there are a lot of famous, famous uh, damage mechanics theories that you need to learn, okay? Uh, stress relief, uh, residual stress concepts and all those that we don't learn in the B tech, okay. But uh, it, you should take some of those advanced level classes so that you learn about those damage mechanics, okay. Damage mechanics is an area of study in in engineering, okay. And uh, most of the time, damage mechanics deals with uh, uh, statistical quantification of damage modes. So that theory can be useful sometimes in forensic cases. 
Um, recently, I reviewed a paper, and, and uh, they used some second-moment theory, secondary-moment theory, to help explain the failure mode of their case. I think it also deals with pre-stressed concrete. And, and I thought that was really, really innovative and daring, okay? Because like I say, usually when you face this kind of investigation, you wanted to make the language as simple, analysis as simple as possible, because the lawyer understand. If he doesn't understand, then, you know, you have no case. But in this case, the guys actually use advanced structural theories to explain how the system failed. Okay, and they were able to build that into a fine element model. I thought that was pretty, oh, no, no, no. They used the secondary uh, uh, method from plasticity to explain the failure. So they actually do the analysis like a frame, and then how this plastic mode introduced another plastic moment, another plastic moment. So they use that to explain the failure mode. I, I have not personally done that, and I thought that was pretty innovative. Because that eventually will lead to collapse, you know, the, the uh, what do you call that, progressive collapse theory, okay, which is one of the most uh, uh, new structural research area. Yeah, people trying to uh, understand not just uh, how a structure failed, but how progressive failure would happen. Yeah. Also, uh, before that the incident happened, mm. they took an interview for the Mauliwakam collapse oh. uh, to a wor worker. Uh -huh. uh, he was saying that uh, he was realizing some sort of uh, shake. When they were uh, in the building, the worker? The building. Oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, that gives me again another question. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, what, uh, what, what sort of that shake is? Right, right, yeah. Uh, and he was claiming that the columns were... Uh, Two week, uh -huh. uh, that was an another uh, yeah. another thing. But but uh, we have seen pictures of, I mean before collapse, people were all over the building, oh, yeah. build build stuff, right? So I think uh, if it can st sustain its own self weight overload. at that point, overload, overload, might overload will be possible. overload will be quick failure, right? Yeah, and and why have yeah, so so there may be a combination of overload and then rain, water intrusion of some kind, you know. But again, why it fell horizontal, and and that kind of spread is is the question. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I think uh, that's what the German simulation. You know, they show if you were only few columns that were built poorly, then the collapse were more more like imploding rather than exploding, you know. And then if you have horizontal force, then you'll most likely be leaning one way or the other rather than like a lotus. And moreover, the planned location, the columns were also not that much symmetric in the intermediate no. level. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a yeah, some this way, there. some that way. Yeah, even that puzzled me. Mm. Uh, why have they uh, did the thing? But yeah. the same design would be there for the Tower 2 too. Right, same yeah. Thing. Same design for the Tower 2, yeah. So the, I know the, the, the structural engineer was being questioned numerous times about his qualification. But yeah, again, Normally these the things are, that makes the things complicated. Yes, if it yeah. is a symmetric uh -huh. one, we would not have faced these sort of failures. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know why why he designed in such a manner. Yeah. But Maybe for some architectural uh, reason. Some yeah, space. trying to optimize the interior <laughs> space. Yeah. Anyway, this is uh, this was very huge. So at that time, uh, again, the section of that columns will be uh, very large. Yeah. Is, is this a famous case? I mean, before was the building of this two famous in the? It was a very highway talk of the top. Really? Talk of the oh, city. okay. Uh, so it's already a high profile. It was, uh, no, no, no. I mean, before the collapse. Uh, Are you aware of these two buildings before the collapse? No. 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 Yeah. Right, right, but but regionally, because in Chennai there are other higher buildings, yeah. No, 
uh, I mean to say that this sort of collapse mm. uh, only after happening it spreaded like anything. Yeah, in, uh, yeah. But but it's it's not it's not like the. Uh, I mean, it wasn't famous famous like. I mean, before they do the design and all that, so no one scrutinized the structural engineer even before he. I think the approval and other things also was done. Uh, mm. It was not in a procedural way. Uh, like the, the contractual, heard, yeah. But I am not very sure. Mm -hmm. The contractual the way, promoters, yeah. They, the Swisti, they are the one who performed this. Mm. But, uh, I don't know yeah. uh, what happened to them. Their thing is gone now. Right, so yeah. They have lost all their... Uh, their, their assets, yeah. Assets mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so, you know... This is this is the kind of cases that really really needs. I saw him coming uh, several times to Professor C and such. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, trying to get the case. Yeah, get the case, but yeah. finally it went in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Professor C and sir was not uh, involved directly. I think. No, he's or not. Only yeah. Anna University Chennai was uh, not was involved by the government. Mm -hmm. That was the yeah, and 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 so. My other question is that um, why Anna Univers University was? Yeah. That's another question. Uh -huh, yeah. They could have gone to IITs. Right, or yeah. Or some other. They could uh -huh. have come to NIT. Right, yeah. But I heard later IIT professor Mahal Prasad, he also has. Uh, he was also in. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Inspected along with. Uh, right. But, but how much can they do? You know how much can they? Because I I believe even when they involved the the material may have already been removed. Yeah. So how much can they investigate is also questionable. Yeah. And the government was acting uh, mm. a bit smart up. Yeah. They were mm -hmm. Quickly removing the evidence. Yeah. Uh huh. Sorry. Yes. The building has collapsed, right? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So, like the German professor is saying, if there is a, 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 a electric electrification of the rebars, the rebars would see deformation. You know, it's high temperature, high high electric charge. You know, there will be evidence, but they shouldn't have removed. Yeah, we will be able to see a lot if we can get to the site. Even if it's poor concreting, we can tell by doing some sam core sample, right? So there are so much we, we can know if we only have access to the site. Yeah, but uh, unfortunately, you know, that was not the case. Yeah. But uh, uh, accountability is a very important issue. Accountability, okay? Whenever this kind of uh, incidents happen, there's not only a professional responsibility, there's also a moral and ethical responsibility as well that we need to be able to learn something from this case. Okay, and, and just leave it to the, 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 you know, I don't want to say a political process. Um, even then, we should still stress as an engineering profession that there is a... Um, a, a critical element missing in this case that we can learn so much from this one one study yeah. okay that's all I have right any more slides and then yeah this is the last slide so but uh, I use this as a case to show you you know you are responsible for doing an investigation even to the level that you build a very simple model at home to demonstrate how you feel is very important part of the investigation. Yeah, because whatever you do, so our, our series of experiments really just to show one, uh, the uh, shaking of the ground is not going to be the case. In fact, we did some experiment. We shake the whole thing and then see how the top would uh, collapse. You know, and and so in most cases it will not collapse, leaning so nicely. It will be jumbled up. Yeah, and so so by doing a series of experiments, then you can demonstrate to the court, hey, you know, this is how I do my deduction 
Okay, that that parses with deduction. Okay, and then uh, this is this is our conclusion. But without doing all this, and you just sit there and use your mind to imagine, very risky. Yeah, because you are not doing uh, investigation. You are you know. You're not you're not uh, doing your job really, yeah, and that is what distinguishes between a design engineer and a forensic engineer. You do the investigation. Yeah. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Yeah, how are you guys doing with the uh, project? Are you doing a report? Are you preparing your uh, PowerPoint? Good. Yeah, because that that will be <laughs> that will be a very useful experience for you, okay? Especially once you guys start to, now you see how I do investigation, you start you know, asking yourself questions. How can you present your data in a meaningful way to, to your client? And tomorrow I'll be talking about geotech, okay? So as I described, my, most of my geotech investigations require some kind of physical testing, okay? How do you analyze the data? How do you present your data is, you know, Parallel, but maybe a little bit deviate from my structural investigation. Okay, structural you can do a lot more, but geotech would take more imagination. Okay, that's all I have for today. Thank you guys, and don't forget tonight. Okay, we'll meet at six. Yeah. Okay, at the guest house. Okay.